I'm going to talk a little bit about two of our initiatives that we have on the ground right now that are both, both with the impetus to sequester carbon. One is a restorative ocean economies initiative and one is a building for carbon sequestration, building to reverse climate change. Um, but I want to take a step back because um, one of the pieces of the puzzle that um, we feel very passionate about at Lyft Economy is the idea that business can be a regenerative force for ecosystems. Um, the, and just noticing so many of the impactful talks yesterday around this, this vision of really being in sacred relationship with ecosystems and the dissonance that so many of us face when we have to go back to our world where we pay for rent with money and that trail of money has often brought so much exploitation in its wake or we pay for our food with money. At Lyft Economy, we've worked with over 150 social enterprises over the past six years and we've been trying to identify what are the patterns that innovative social entrepreneurs are using to get out of that trap and move into a more restorative relationship with ecosystems. And I look at building regenerative businesses as a bridge to that. It's not the end game, but it's a bridge to that. Um, and so what is a restorative business? Any ideas? Something that's not a fossil fuel company. Yeah. Something that restores the environment, creates living wage jobs. Creates living wage jobs, restores the environment. Any other ideas? Replenishes the resources it takes. Replenishes the resources. Um, a really great example. How many of you saw Elizabeth Kaiser's talk yesterday? Right? She can demonstrably say that they've increased 6 to 10% soil carbon content through the practice of producing goods and services for her community. And that 90% of those goods go to the 15 mile radius that she mentioned. So Lift Economy, we do believe it's possible. We've seen instances of it being possible. And we are looking at federating and connecting those examples through folks like Megan, who has been in our MBA class, has seen that. Um, so two particular areas I mentioned. Um, and I, I wanted to just say that I, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes, and then I'd love for this to be more interactive and a dialogue. Um, to make it relevant and useful for you as you walk out into your world and have to put these practices into implementation. And so the, the first initiative I'll mention is the Restorative Ocean Economies Initiative. So um, I have been inspired by the notion that a network of restorative ocean farms the size of Washington can feed the world. And this was something I learned from Bren Smith. How many of you are familiar with his work? Bren Smith. Um, so he's a founder of a company, nonprofit called Green Wave. Um, and they were recently featured on 60 Minutes. Uh, they're a nonprofit that has piloted a mechanism of producing food, 10 tons of kelp per acre in an ocean and 150,000 shellfish off of that one same acre. Scaling this up, that's where that number comes from around the potential to feed the world with just a, a small subsection of our ocean ecosystems. Oysters as a keystone species in that have the potential to filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. This is a zero input food because there's no freshwater use. Um, the mechanism is to drop lines of kelp and drop sacks filled with oysters and have them grow in the open ocean. And the best part of his solution is it's open source. So his vision is to use the nonprofit platform 
to actually educate social enterprises around the globe in this method of ocean production. Now, why this is interesting and important and is that he's done it in Long Island, but the context in California is very different. California deals with the California Coastal Commission. Um, we have laws that regulate. And so for the past two years, Lift Economy has been interrogating how do we actually replicate this model of what Brenz calls the 3D ocean farming model in California. And particularly because how many of you have heard of the purple urchin barrens that are facing the California coast? Right. So the phenomenon that we're, is happening on the California coast right now is that for the existing intact kelp ecosystems that we've had for hundreds of thousands of years, it are, um, they've, they've occurred a die-off in the past five years due to warming water temperatures and the um, starfish die-off. And so starfish and otters predate, predate on the pur native purple urchins and we've lost those keystone predators. And so the purple urchins have come back and predated in turn on the giant kelp forest. And we lost about 95% in the past five years. Um, the researchers that I'm talking with at the Bodega Marine Lab this year have seen colder waters come in and they've seen a bit of a comeback in some of the kelp forests and um, help the kelp campaign as a great resource to look at and see the, what's actually happening on the ground. But Lift Economy has been focused on what are the entrepreneurial mechanisms to solve this as well. Um, and there's two that I want to point to. One is partnering with ports. There's 11 ports in California, and these ports have jurisdiction over what happens in these harbors and in these ports. And the San Diego port has actually funded a one-year pilot project with two entrepreneurs whose company is called Sunken Seaweeds to actually grow kelp in the Bren Smith methodology called 3D ocean farming in the port of San Diego. So to actually do this as um, a mechanism of economic development in the port of San Diego, um, to do it as a, is a restorative mechanism backed by a port authority. It's pretty cool. The other mechanism that I have been researching and engaging with is a company called Urchinomics. So it's kind of a novel idea to actually take what are currently starving purple urchins. Urchinomics, just like economics, but urchinomics. So to take what are now starving purple urchins, which are not fit for a suitable market, but if anyone's heard of uni, that's a high echelon sushi um, ingredient. And so uni is actually what is contained in the purple urchin. Um, and uh, I, you can come and see I have some pictures of how urchinomics is actually harvesting these purple urchins to save the, the, the kelp effectively, take them off of these urchin barrens. Um, feed them a pelletized kelp-based food source, and in six to 10 weeks, they're now ready for market. There's actually can be a market driver to incentivize removal of these purple urchins off of the sea, sea floor. And we're not the only place in this world that has urchin barrens. These are actually happening all around the globe. And so Urchinomics is a global company looking at solving this crisis through producing a food that is in quite high demand around the globe. So I think I'll stop there and I want to mention one other to connect the land and ocean connection. One other initiative that Lift Economy is working on and then open it up for more dialogue. Um, we have also been studying the potential for sequestration in our built environment. Just as kelp has the potential to sequester five times more than land-based plants because it's just such a productive plant, photosynthesizer in the ocean. Um, we've been working with a partner, Massey Burke, who's a local natural builder actually in El Sobrante, Oakland, who has done preliminary research that within a building envelope, we have the potential to sequester nine tons of carbon per building. 
And how that works is putting carbon-based, lignin-based, carbohydrate-based material, straw, into the building to seal it in perpetuity. Um, why this is exciting and important is there's an opportunity by convening philanthropists, investors, practitioners, and even development corporations to move this from sort of a niche, uh, niche market into the mainstream. And this opportunity is um, especially perpetuated by the fact that we've had the most severe three past three years of fires in California. So an added benefit is that these buildings can not only be um, carbon sequestration mechanisms, but also can be fire resilient. Um, and one of, my pa one of my favorite pictures of this phenomenon is a straw built structure built and designed by Arkin Tilt Architects, who's a great uh, local designer of these structures, where somebody had stacked a pile of firewood right next to their building. And the after pictures of the building after it had been decimated the entire landscape by a fire is that the only, the only thing that happened to the building was discoloration on the wall where the firewood burned, but the building did not. So these structures can actually be resilient if they're designed appropriately um, to, to the fires that we're seeing plaguing our communities. Um, let me just check in my notes here. I think that that was the bulk of the overview that I wanted to give around the two initiatives that, that Lift Economy is, is focused on. Um, and where I would like to go now, um, because this is, this is sort of uh, one of my struggles with these types of conferences, is how do we actually take some of these principles and start in our own lives and livelihoods moving from a place of, um, of really into practicing, right? into, into the practice of. Um, so I'd love to move into some questions that might have come up in some of those yeah. You mentioned nine ton sequestration. Is that a one time deal or is that per annum or anything on the time, on yeah. the time period base? So that's a great question. So it would be nine tons of sequestration over the life the lifetime of the building. Um, and depending on how how long that building withstands, but the, you know, okay. these buildings are built to last. They're, they're, right. A lot of this research is based in buildings that we still have access to. Um, Burkina Faso right. has building. yeah. So if you did uh, an amendment or you, you did an extension, an annex to the building, you could do the same to the annex. You could do it all over again. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the yeah, one of the um, tragedies of certainly what's happening in Sonoma County, which is where I'm from, is that so much of the rebuild discussion is talking about concrete, right? Because that's the mainstream paradigm for what we see as a potential for um, making our communities fire resilient. The problem with that is you're not addressing the whole system, which is a lot of these fires are actually um, ex exacerbated by climate change. So I'm not saying that climate change is the only cause, but certainly some of the ignition factors have been exacerbated by extreme wind events. Um, and so if we solve the rebuild with something that exacerbates the climate, crisis that we're already perpetuating in each of our daily actions, um, I look at that as a real missed opportunity. Um, and I'd like to see us uh, put forward something that can solve not just the carbon equation, but also, especially in Sonoma County, we have a huge unemployment issue now, especially after the fires. We have um, uh, workers that were employed in some of the homes that were, that were destroyed and how do we actually train a whole generation of natural builders that can then be part and parcel to the solution to the fire rebuild. Um, 
The other interesting thing when you get into the building, the climate beneficial building realm, is that um, a lot, so much of the building dialogue around carbon in the building has been the carbon emissions associated with the lifetime, the lifespan of the building, the, the energy use, if you will, but not about the embodied energy. So you can have these um, net, net zero energy buildings that completely disregard the embodied carbon and actually in some cases are higher if you look at the whole lifespan of the building because they're using things like um, high density foam that's a petroleum based product. When we can use things like wool, which is fire resilient, and refurbished denim and recycled and straw and those sorts of things that are bio based. And the other conundrum when you get into that net zero energy building space is that if it does happen to burn again, these tox toxins in our environment also are burning. Whereas if you use natural buildings from the get-go, um, those, uh, even if they do burn, which hopefully they don't because they're designed in an appropriate fashion, um, but even if they do burn, they're not perpetuating all this toxicity in our environments. You both have <laughs> over it. Um, I was gonna ask a little bit more about, about Lyft and sort of its role and how specifically they're supporting these kind of projects yeah. and maybe speak a little bit to like the patterns that you see emerging because that seems like one of the large, large zoomed out goals. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. So two ways. Um, we, Lyft Economy has hosted a series of convenings for the restorative oceans economies. And we've actually had um, verbal affirmation that these convenings have produced business deals that otherwise wouldn't happen. So for example, um, with the sunken seaweeds in San Diego, they came to a convening, met a researcher at Stanford, met something that supported their specific enterprise. And it is powerful when we get together around shared themes like soil, not oil, like um, restorative oceans, because the the um, momentum, so much of the time, especially when we're talking with oceans, the mainstream momentum is conserve it, protect it, don't touch it. We're actually past that point of no return, as I mentioned, with regards to our kelp ecosystems. If we don't touch these kelp ecosystems, having removed the top keystone predators, they are going to continue to die. We need people in the water create courageous enough to be planting kelp lines and to be petitioning our jurisdictions to say these laws that we put into place that represent citizen interests that the Coastal Commission um, implements, they're not serving us anymore. And so the other um, convenings, so that's more the citizen facing convenings. The other convenings that we've been responsible to helping to organize are policy driven convenings where we're actually speaking with policymakers around um, how, how they're conceiving of creating a unified permitting mechanism so that the state of California, not everyone has to submit their own permit to secure an ocean lease, but we can have a streamlined permitting process. It's very similar to a project I worked on a, many years ago with, with Greywater, where we streamlined the permitting process for Greywater so that it wasn't such a cumbersome thing for legislators to look at and have to reconceive of um, and, and do something completely new and examine each project in its own uniqueness. It was a simplified, um, uh, consistent permit that each project could just use, like a plug and play permit that was very recognizable to legislators. Um, it's the same sort of thing that we're doing with the, the building aspects, which is once, once, once legislators have a technical precedent to point to, like what Massey Burke, she just permitted the first um, fully permitted cob structure in Berkeley. And so now Berkeley, um, Berkeley city officials have something to point to 
when they're looking at other natural building techniques, all the technical precedent. But, and then I, I can actually, I will show um, a slide to talk about some of the design principles for thinking about our enterprises. So maybe I'll do that after your question. Sure. So I've started working with the Colorado uh, Hemp Producers Cooperative and wanted to find out on the building side relative to hemp and if that's coming in because um, I've known about hempcrete so, but never thought about measuring the sequestered amount because it's locked in there as a value and then also have recently learned about um, that they are headed towards being able to make hemp composite lumber and so I've heard, I, I didn't hear the very beginning of what you talked about, but in Oregon they're pioneering cross-laminated timber buildings, and they're also working that, on that, and the same idea is using lumber for that is apparently as indestructible as steel. So uh, the combinations are, are really magnificent. Yeah, yeah. Um, that Cross limited timber was featured in. Um, how many of you are familiar with the book Drawdown? Yeah, so Drawdown, um, one of the Lyft partners, and I wanted to show a picture of, of all of us so you saw that it wasn't just me, but uh, the Lyft co founder, Kevin Bayouk, is actually the senior financial advisor for Project Drawdown. So, for those of you that aren't familiar with Drawdown, it's a comprehensive uh, um, accounting of all of the R&D ready solutions, shovel ready solutions that we have at our disposal right now to reverse global warming. And so it's a book full of 100 solutions um, and cross laminated timber is mentioned in that as a coming attraction. Uh, and certainly the use of wood is a natural material, material that we can account for as a component of the carbon sequestration in that building envelope. Um, going back to your point about hemp, so hemp is something that I'm very excited about. Uh, Lift Economy is actually working with um, Winona LaDuc, who is the founder of Honor the Earth and lives on White Earth Reservation in, in Minnesota. And her vision is really to leverage the interest around hemp to create um, a fully self-contained hemp industry on White Earth Reservation that could produce not just hemp herds, but also fine fibers. And so we've been in a deep dive around the type of processing infrastructure required to create the, the fiber component that is 20% of the hemp. So the rest of it though, the 80%, the hemp herds, has a multitude of uses. One is in hempcrete and in natural building. There are others as well in terms of um, animal bedding is the current market ready uh, driver. There's, there's animal, hemp animal bedding products that are just flying off the shelves and out of stock in many cases. So there's a market, market opportunity right bird in hand. Um, uh, but there's so many multi multitudes of uses for those hemp herds um, that are really uh, you know, the, the bulk of, of the biomass. That you're, that you're generating off of growing hemp for fiber. And of course, so many of us are really excited about um, hemp as a fiber solution. Um, yeah. So follow up on that with the cooperative that um, working with, they were headed for basically doing a crowd equity funding, and but they have to be on a platform and then they turn around and the platform they were talking to said, sorry, we won't do anything with hemp. Is that something that Lyft potentially in the capacity helps with organizations like that? Which, which collective are you speaking about? This is in Colorado. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And they were looking at a platform that was... That yeah, but in order to do the crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding yeah. that is legal now, you have to do it through a platform. And so the plan, I've only recently connected, they've been working for a year and a half on it. Yeah. But, um, and it was WeFunder or one of those? No, no, the, this is one of the equity cr 
crowdfunders, mm -hmm. not uh, uh, gift crowdfunding, which yeah. we fund is more of a gifting thing. This no, is a WeFunder is one of those. The, ah, that's okay. the, WeFunder was the platform other. that okay. we use. So, so, so a little bit of context. So one of the places that Lift Economy supports is in capitalizing your, your sustainable enterprise. And so um, one of the challenges that we've seen time and time again is that um, women and people of color are categorically excluded from traditional means of acquiring capital. So, you know, venture capital is largely loans to other white men. It's, it's represented as mostly white men that are managing those firms. Um, and so those patterns are perpetuated in who, who's able to access funding when they start up an idea. Um, and an enterprise. So what you're referring to is, is the collective kind of problem solving through how do they get resources to make their vision a reality. Um, one strategy that, that Lyft has used and successfully raised um, $401,000 via the WeFunder platform. And so um, a couple years back, the Jobs Act was passed into law. And that met, made it possible for um, everyday enterprises to raise money from non-accredited investors via a platform such as WeFunder. It has to be a platform approved by the Securities Exchange Commission. Um, WeFunder is one such. But there are lots of other really creative ways to raise money. Um, East Bay Prec in Oakland is using a mechanism where they are a California cooperative. And they can raise money from non-accredited investors just by being a California cooperative. They can raise up to $1,000 per investor. Um, there's also friends and family ways to raise money. Um, so yeah, there's sur such a multitude. I have not yet experienced the bias that you describe around not investing in hemp-based initiatives. Um, but I'd be interested in tackling that one because I do think that um, that it's it's a requisite for an economy that works for the benefit all of all life. It's one of the most uh, you know miraculous um, that there's another cool thing about hemp that I didn't mention, which is that when we blend hemp with wool, it makes a performance fiber that otherwise you can't attain without using toxic chemicals. So a lot of the wool that's on the market today is actually, in order to make it so that it doesn't re-felt itself in the washing machine, they have to treat it. So some of the smart wools and those sorts of things, they'll actually coat the, the fibers with a plastic or they'll treat it with a chlorine wash. And so hemp is this miraculous fiber that for fiber shed, um, which is another organization I consult with and I'm a part of. Um, Fibershed has done these amazing trials blending California grown wool with hemp, usually sourced from Colorado uh, for, right, for right now, and creating these amazing, really soft fibre, uh, fabrics, hemp and wool blending that doesn't require any toxic chemicals. Um, so that's another exciting aspect. We'll continue on. We'll continue, yeah. So with both the issues you're tackling, I heard that there's first a policy barrier. Yeah. And then the second part of it is arranging the markets so they actually kind of fix the problem, create more of a restorative cycle. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if that informs, how that informs your work. Do you tackle policy first? Lyft, do I usually think of as more on the market side, you know, working mm -hmm. with businesses to mm -hmm. more, but I'm interested to hear more. Yeah. Yeah. We, we are open and adaptive to what is required to implement these types of economic solutions. Largely, what we've seen effective um, is empowering the entrepreneurs to think through the steps, the critical path steps for their enterprise, and then convening the others that, are, that have shared literacy about that same topic area to work together on those issues. So with regards to policy, certainly we're not policy experts around oceans, but we've been developing a level of literacy so that we can connect the policy makers to the entrepreneurs that are on the ground that can give them the most realistic perspective on what is actually needed to um, 
ultimately support their goals. California Coastal Commission has the same, ironically, the same goals as these entrepreneurs um, to protect and, and steward uh, our ocean ecosystems. Um, but there's a stagnation that happens in policy because it's not oftentimes quite as nimble as entrepreneurs, sure. business, markets. Did that answer your question yeah. at all? Um, let me just check our time. Okay, we have some more time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about in terms of... Can't hear you. Sorry. So I'm wondering about in terms of uh, drawing the carbon down into these different materials. Um, when you're talking about in a building that has a really long life, and so you could consider that it's permanently mm -hmm. in there. But for something like animal bedding, mm -hmm. then you might think that could get released back into the atmosphere in a sure. shorter time period. So I think people say like if it's 100 years, then it's, you could say that it's permanently in there, because you can't really foresee beyond 100 years anyway, but do you have some kind of way you look at that issue? Sure, yeah, I mean, what, what you're referring to is looking at um, the life cycle, essentially, of, of, of the goods and services that we're delivering to the market. Um, yeah, I think it really has to happen on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and you work in metrics, sustainability metrics, is that correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah, were we in another Yeah, yeah, I yeah, you know, I remember. So, um, one of the, yeah, I mean, one of the challenges that I'll just call out is um, when we're looking at, at life cycle, is it does reduce down to just carbon. And um, one of the things that I think is so inspiring, and I'll go back to the singing frogs farm example, is that they're, they're building a model and a mechanism that certainly they have some evidence for the carbon sequestered in their soils, um, the increase in soil carbon, um, but they're really, not to deflect your question, but I think we do need, I get into so many conversations where we are reducing it to just a carbon question rather than looking at um, how we're healing our, our social systems just as much as uh, we're healing our aquifer systems, we're healing our biodiversity systems. So yeah, hemp bedding wouldn't be a carbon sequestering mechanism per se, but there are other elements of that enterprise model that can be layered in that can sequester carbon. Um, and yeah, it's an interesting place to play in because it gives so much energy um, from philanthropists. Certainly at the Global Climate Action Summit, there will be a lot of talk around um, one size silver bullet solutions to, to, um, to reduce our carbon load. Um, a question that comes up for me is, if we're just addressing climate change, and this question isn't new to most of you, if we're just addressing climate change through perpetuating the same social systems that we have that are entrenched in some of the exploitation mentality, are we actually progressing forward? Um, so one, you know, one of the things that I, um, I love so much about the Green Wave strategy is it's, it is open source and replicable and they're, they're aiming to empower um, the ocean fishermen to replicate and innovate this model in their particular place. Certainly that's a consideration in terms of the um, sequestered carbon with producing food, right? It's, if the kelp grows and it produces X amount of carbon, it's not going to be um, persistent carbon because it's going back into the food system. So if we don't have composting systems like Janelle Orsi mentioned in her talk, um, it's not going to become soil carbon again. That answer your question. Does anybody else have answers to the question that you asked? That was good. That was a good answer. <laughs> uh, one of the things yeah. on the kelp is kelp is also being shown to be a food additive for cows. And when you add it as a food additive for cows, it reduces the methane that the cows emit dramatically because it actually balances out the nutritional qualities that are necessary so that in fact there isn't this excess methane being produced. As a result of that, it would end up back in the land. 
uh, in that in two different forms because actually the methane is, I believe, somewhere near 20 times as potent as carbon dioxide. So you actually, so it is a, a complex holistic system when you try to get into metrics, which were only beginning phases of having folks actually put these models together so that you can track all these different features that are coming into play. And I think that's you know part of the challenge and the work over the next few years is to pull these in so that we can analyze holistic systems and say, okay, we're picking up this here and that there for these reasons. But metrics is critical in terms of escalating the speed of what we're doing. Yeah. I was just reading something too that I I think they're showing. I think they're starting to show that kelp can it, a, a large percentage of the carbon that it brings in. It releases into the deep ocean and it's permanently sequestered there. So even if it gets wiped out or harvested, that it there's still like a large percentage that's. Yeah. If it if the kelp makes its way down to the ocean floor, that's a, yeah. That's a, that's a great place for it actually because that car that carbon is. Meantime, though, we have the opportunity for feeding our communities. And when you look at the alternatives of um, other uh, food inputs that we consume on a daily basis, the embodied carbon of those can be less if we're sourcing from within a 100-mile radius of a coastal ecosystem, feeding urban populations with kelp grown out in the open water there. Um, I think I'm up for time. I think there's another session here that wants to um, come in and, and, and what is the name of this se next session? Assessing Biodiversity for Support of Climate Resilience. Great. Oh my gosh, that sounds really interesting. So um, what I will do is I have cards here and I'll leave them here and you can pass them around. Um, and maybe just a question to, to leave you with. Um, I am so curious around how, um, how you all are going to take elements of what you've learned from this conference and start the process, the long process, of continuing to move our lives into more restorative relationship with ecosystems. And I, I, I just, I feel so passionate that um, that cognitive dissonance that I mentioned earlier of, of so often thinking about these concepts in an abstract way, but then going back and finding our lives are quite dominated by the mainstream economy. Um, that's, the, that's the question that I find to be one of the most interesting and challenging struggles for all of us on a daily basis. I'd love to learn more with all of you around how you're grappling with that. Um, and and you know how you're weaving gift and barter and 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 different forms of reciprocity into your lives and livelihoods because I think that that's just as strong of a component as is in developing restorative businesses. So thank you so much. Thank you.